What's up guys, welcome back. So this is going to be a final step study guide, if you will, for the pants. Um, it includes a lot of high yield terms, a lot of micro vignettes. So I'll do it into a similar format as what has been done before, kind of reading the question once or twice, giving you a second to make that association, figure out the answer, and then say the answer. So kind of, and there's gonna be all in random order too. So kind of as a test would be, um, just rapid fire going through them, all random order. Um, just kind of see what you know. You can also pause it in between them, and but obviously the answer is on the screen. So, so without further ado, we'll start. Um, so, at what age should you begin ordering DEXA scans for male patients, and when would you order them for female patients? So, this is screening for osteoporosis. So, 70-year-old males you want to start screening, and 65 for females. What are the ranges for DEXA scores for osteopenia and osteoporosis? So, the ranges are... For osteopenia and osteoporosis for DEXA scan, osteopenia is going to be negative 1 to negative 2.4, and these are actually standard deviations, and osteoporosis is going to be negative 2.4 or greater. So osteoporosis, negative 2.4 or greater, osteopenia, negative 1 to negative 2.4. What is the number one cause of compartment syndrome? So what's the number one cause of compartment syndrome? That's going to be a tibial shaft fracture, a tibial shaft fracture. And what are the six P's of compartment syndrome? That's going to be pain, pulselessness, poikilothermia, paralysis, and uh, paresthesias. And one more, pallor? is pallor as well. So the six P's of compartment syndrome. And remember, those are the same as acute arterial occlusion as well. So the six P's you can also find in acute arterial occlusion as well as compartment syndrome. And that's, again, tibial shaft fracture. Okay, so a patient's lab work shows a positive Smith antibody and a positive DS, double-stranded DNA antibody. What's the most likely diagnosis? So what do you associate Smith antibody and DS DNA antibodies with? So that's going to be SLE, systemic lupus, erythematosus. What are Bouchard's nodes? So where are Bouchard's nodes found? Bouchard's nodes are found in the PIP, the proximal interphalangeal joint. Where would you find uh, Heberden's nodes? Heberden's nodes would be in the DIP. And in what condition are these? Um, OA or RA? That's going to be osteoarthritis for these two. Bouchard's in the PIP, Heberden's in the DIP. What will an x-ray show in acute osteomyelitis? So what will an x-ray show in acute osteomyelitis? Nothing. It won't show anything. It will show bone destruction in chronic osteomyelitis, however. What is the best imaging modality to diagnose osteomyelitis? You can either do a bone scan to diagnose osteomyelitis or an MRI. So a bone scan or MRI to diagnose osteomyelitis. And like we said, an X-ray really won't show anything in acute osteomyelitis. You're going to have to wait till chronic osteomyelitis. So a micro vignette, a 22-year-old male presents with what is clearly a septic knee. You notice lesions on his hands and feet as well. What's the most likely pathogen? So that's going to be Neisseria gonorrhea. And remember for gonorrhea is RTA. How I remember it is rash, tenosynovitis, and arthralgias. So those are the three things you might find with a disseminated um, Neisseria gonorrhea infection. What would you expect the white blood cells to be in, a joint, um, in the joint fluid of that infected knee? So on arthrocentesis, you get that, and it should be over 50,000 white blood cells at minimum. A patient with a painless mass in her right wrist, what would you think of? So what is a patient with a painless mass in her right wrist, most likely? So that's most likely going to be a ganglion cyst which is just an outpouching of synovial fluid and membrane, basically, in the wrist. So painless in her right wrist, ganglion cyst. What is the age range for osteosarcoma, and also where are they most typically found in the body? So age range for osteosarcoma, and where are they most typically found in the body? So osteosarcoma, it's usually between 15 to 25-year-old, more, more uh, commonly males, and they're more commonly found around the knee. So in the um, distal femur, or the proximal tibia most commonly. So osteosarcoma, the worst bone tumor, 15 to 25-year-old males in the distal femur or the proximal tibia.
and that's that starburst or sunburst pattern on the knee. And that's different from Ewing sarcoma, which remember is the onion skinning pattern, or the raised periosteum in the onion skinning for Ewing sarcoma, but osteosarcoma is going to have that Codman's triangle as well as that starburst or sunburst pattern as well. Okay, so you think a patient may have an osteoid osteoma due to his complaint of severe night pain. You set him up for an x-ray, but in the meantime, what medication do you want to start him on? So if it's, if it's truly an osteoid osteoma, ibuprofen will resolve his pain. So why? So they have a prostaglandin secreting nidus, a nidus just a localization. So the osteoid osteoma secretes prostaglandins, so we know ibuprofen and other NSAIDs inhibit prostaglandins. So if it is truly an osteoid osteoma, inhibiting those prostaglandins will resolve his pain. So if you have clicking or locking of the knee, what does that indicate? Clicking or locking of the knee. Patient comes in with clicking and locking of the knee. You want to think of a meniscal tear. A 65-year-old presents with complaining of severe pain in his great toe. That began when he woke up this morning. It is swollen, red, and very tender. What's the most likely diagnosis? So that's going to be, of course, gout would be the number one based on the location. But you can also think about a septic, septic joint as well. So gout, what is that called? Pedagra, if it's in that first uh, metatarsal phalangeal joint. What uric acid level helps to confirm the diagnosis of gout? So what is the uric acid level to help confirm the diagnosis of gout? That's going to be over 7.5. However, remember, the levels of uric acid can be even lower in a gout attack as well, or they can be higher. They're not necessarily indicative or diagnostic. But over 7.5 might help you confirm it as well. What is the medical treatment of gout? What is the medical treatment of gout? So you would have to differentiate if it's acute or chronic. So allopurinol, that would be more in chronic gout, a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. And colchicine would be more in acute. And you can also use NSAIDs, corticosteroid injections as well for acute. A pathology report comes back with positive birefringent crystals. What's the most likely diagnosis? So that's positively birefringent crystals. That's going to be pseudogout or calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate deposition disorder. So that's pseudogout and they're positively birefringent. How about negatively birefringent? What would you think about if it was negatively birefringent? Negatively birefringent, that would be regular old gout. Negatively birefringent, that's gout. A patient with a history of hepatitis B complaining of bilateral knee pain, fever, and weight loss. What is the most likely diagnosis? So hepatitis B, bilateral knee pain, fever, and weight loss. What's the most likely diagnosis? That's going to be polyarteritis nodosa. So polyarteritis nodosa, you want to associate that with hepatitis B. You suspect a patient has polyarteritis nodosa. What is the best test for a definitive diagnosis and what is the treatment? So you want to do a biopsy in this case and high dose steroids. So a lot of these rheumatologic conditions, um, if you don't know what it is, go with the high dose steroids or the steroids in general if they have prednisone or something like that. Because there are a lot of inflammatory disorders. And biopsy is the best way to make a definitive diagnosis for PAN. So on physical exam, you notice ulnar deviation and a swan neck deformity. What is the most likely diagnosis? So on physical exam, ulnar deviations and a swan neck deformity. So that's going to be RA, rheumatoid arthritis. So remember in, uh, in the long term of rheumatoid arthritis, they can have that destruction of the joints, and that leads to the ulnar deviation and swan neck deformities as well. A positive NEARS test indicates what diagnosis? So remember from orthopedics, NEARS test indicates what? That's going to be rotator cuff impingement, especially the supraspinatus. List three medications that can cause lupus. So list three medications that can cause lupus. Procainamide, isoniazid, and quinidine are here. Um, also hydralazine, isoniazide, and um, primaquine, and procainamide. I remember that by HIPQ, H-I-P-Q. And also what is the, if they give you the um, lab marker is going to be uh, histone, is going to be histones.
So if you see histones and they have a medication like this, you want to think drug-induced lupus. What test do you want to do for Sjogren's syndrome? So what test do you want to do for Sjogren's syndrome? That's going to be the Schreimer test. So the Schreimer test, when you put that um, basically like little piece of paper in the eye and you see that it's they're not tearing up enough. So typically they would have a certain amount of tears past like five millimeters or something on that piece of paper. But with Sjogren's syndrome, <laughs> it's an exocrinopathy. So that includes a, and that includes the, the lacrimal glands. So they're not producing those tears. So we're going to have a positive test when we see a lack of, um, of soaking of that paper. So that's the Schreimer's test. A patient has uh, rheumatoid arthritis and is heading to go to the OR for an ORIF of the ankle. In addition to ankle films, what other x-ray should you get? So this is a good one. So what other x-ray do you always want to get in a patient with RA? So you want to get a C-spine x-ray. So anesthesia will want them due to concerns about the instability of C1 and C2. So remember in RA specifically, they have um, degeneration of the C1 and C2 vertebrae. So they have that allantoaxial instability in C1 and C2 there. What carpal bone has a high rate of non-union in occult fracture? So which carpal bone has a high rate of non-union in occult fracture? So that's going to be the scaphoid. So remember the blood flow to the scaphoid um, goes distal to actually proximal. So if you fracture the scaphoid, especially more proximally, it's going to have a higher rate of non-union because this is there's not very much blood flow getting there. The arterial supply is pretty tenuous there. And you also want to suspect this if you have anatomical snuffbox tenderness. And you always want to put them in a thumb spike of splint if you're suspecting scaphoid fracture with orthopedic follow-up or follow-up with x-rays in a couple weeks. So you don't just want to send them home with NSAIDs and ice for this uh, proposed potentially scaphoid fracture. What medication is used for patients with lupus? So what medication is used for patients with lupus? Like we said, for a lot of rheumatologic conditions, systemic steroids. Scleroderma. The limited version of scleroderma has five characteristics for which Crest syndrome, Crest syndrome is often said. So what are those five? So Crest, C-R-E-S-T, that's calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, so they have symptoms of GERD, sclerodactyly, and also telangiectasias. So crest, calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasias. And do we remember what the rheumatologic um, lab finding is for crest syndrome as opposed to systemic sclerosis? So crest is going to be anti-centromere antibodies. So anti-centromere for the limited crest in scleroderma. But also systemic sclerosis is going to be the SCL70. So those are two that we can't get mixed up. So systemic sclerosis, SCL70, and CREST is going to be the anti-centromere antibodies. So like we already said, there's a sunburst appearance on x-ray. What is the most likely diagnosis? So sunburst appearance on x-ray, what is the most likely diagnosis? That's going to be osteosarcoma. Anatomically, where are 80% of clavicle fractures located. So anatomically, where are 80% of clavicle fractures located? That's going to be in the middle third of the clavicle. So the clavicle is broken up into three chunks, um, distal, proximal, and middle, and the middle third is the most common injured. A pathology report comes back showing negatively birefringent crystals. What's the most likely diagnosis? So we already alluded to this, and that's going to be gout for negatively birefringent crystals. So gout, negatively birefringent, pseudogout, positively birefringent. What are the four muscles of the rotator cuff? So what are the four muscles of the rotator cuff? Commonly referred to as the SITS muscles, S-I-T-S, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. So not teres major, don't get confused, teres minor. So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Describe the characteristics of a lytic lesion on x-ray. So what are the characteristics of a lytic lesion on x-ray? It's going to be spiculated with an elevated periosteum, bone destruction 
in bone destruction. So speculated elevated periosteum in bone destruction for a lytic lesion on x-ray. What ligament is most commonly injured in an ankle sprain? So what is the most common injured ligament in an ankle sprain? That's going to be the ATFL, anterior talofibular ligament. Anterior talofibular ligament, so that's in the lateral side. So that's more common in a inversion injury of the ankle. So they might ask you the mechanism of action. So it's the ankle's inverting and uh, leading to injury of that ATFL on the lateral side. If you have an eversion injury of the ankle, you might be having a sprain to the deltoid ligament, which is attaching to the medial malleolus, so in the medial side, so the opposite side of the ATFL. But the most common for the ankle sprain is ATFL injury. Vasculitis with hepatitis B history should make you think of what diagnosis. So we already alluded to this one. Vasculitis with a hepatitis B history should make you think of polyarteritis nodosa. <clears throat> what is the most common fracture in a, in a child? So the most common fracture in a child is a clavicle fracture. And of course, like we said, in the middle third of the clavicle. A fat pad sign on a lateral x-ray of the elbow has what significance? So what do you think of for a fat pad sign on a lateral x-ray of the elbow especially? So this is significant for blood in the joint indicating a fracture, even if a fracture line cannot be seen on the bone itself. So you want to think of a fracture, either a supracondylar fracture, or if an adult, you want to think of a radial head fracture. And if you see that fat pad sign or sail sign as well, it could be called. So a patient with progressive neck and proximal muscle weakness. Progressive neck and proximal muscle weakness. On physical exam, you see a reddish purple maculopapular rash. On her lab work, it shows a anti-JO antibodies. What's the most likely diagnosis? So this is going to be polymyositis. So again, how I remember it is anti-JO is myositis. And remember, they have these findings also with polymyositis. Progressive neck and proximal muscle weakness. So it's important to differentiate polymyositis from polymyalgia rheumatica. So polymyositis is going to be different because they're going to have that anti jo antibodies. And they're also going to have elevated CK, creatinine kinase, and aldolase as well. So that's how you can differentiate it. Whereas um, polymyalgia rheumatica will not have those. <clears throat> and you can also think that polymyositis it's having progressive neck and proximal muscle weakness. It's not necessarily having pain. So polymyalgia, algia meaning pain, basically, they're having pain as well. So they, mo they could be both having proximal weakness, but uh, polymyalgia rheumatica is more going to have pain too, whereas polymyositis, it's more just that weakness and with the other findings as well. And also remember that polymyalgia rheumatica is associated with the Temporal cell arteritis, so giant cell arteritis as well. But they can be confusing. So which way does a Collie's fracture angulate? Dorsal or volar? And what about a Smith's fracture? So important to differentiate, which way does a Collie's fracture angulate? And which way does a Smith fracture angulate? So Collie's is going to be dorsal, that's the dinner fork deformity. And Smith's is going to be volar. So that's the garden spade, I think they call it. So Smith's is a volar fracture, and Collie's fracture is a dorsal angulation. And also remember, similar to a Smith's is that radial styloid fracture, which is a Barton fracture, sometimes they ask. So a Barton fracture. Tenderness over the anatomical snuff box is indicative of what fracture? So tenderness over the anatomical snuff box, like we already said, a scaphoid fracture. Thumb spike a splint orthopedic follow-up, repeat x-rays. What is the most common fracture in a patient with osteoporosis? So what is the most common fracture in a patient with osteoporosis? So most common fracture in a patient with osteoporosis is going to be a compression fracture of the vertebral body. And then second would be hip fracture. So osteoporosis, they have very brittle bones. Um, so in an elderly, you may find a vertebral body fracture. A 15-year-old boy presents complaining of night pain in the pelvis. Since you have no idea what to do, you order an x-ray. The report comes back with a description of a mass with an onion skin appearance. Onion skin appearance. What is the most likely diagnosis? So we already said onion skin appearance. 
um, is Ewing sarcoma. So how I remember this in the beginning was onions. Although I like onions, I say ew. So onions, ew, and you're thinking of Ewing sarcoma. So onions, ew, Ewing sarcoma, important to differentiate from the sunburst or starburst pattern in the, the Codman's triangle with the osteosarcoma. So important to differentiate those two. And this, like we said, 15 to 25 in men or males and boys as well. So 15 to 25 is the most common age for this to present. And also very important to note is night pain. So if they mention night pain, you want to be concerned of some kind of tumor with orthopedic conditions. So what is the name of the fourth and fifth metacarpal fractures that often result from throwing a punch? So fourth and fifth metacarpal fractures, so the ring and the pinky finger, that often result from throwing a punch. That's going to be the boxer's fracture, the boxer's fracture. And the management of this boxer's fracture will depend on the angulation, the percent angulation. So important to know, boxer's fracture, fourth and fifth metatarsal, patient was throwing a punch. So a new mother presents with pain over the radial wrist. So she was just pregnant. She has pain over the radial wrist. She has a positive Finkelstein's test. What is the most likely diagnosis? So that's going to be Dacrevain's tenosynovitis. So Dacrevain's tenosynovitis for the Finkelstein's test. And the Finkelstein's test is when you, when you make a fist and you cover the thumb and then you ulnarly deviate your thumb and there should be pain over the, um, over the radial aspect of the wrist. And that's where the Dacre veins tenosynovitis is. A positive McMurray sign indicates what diagnosis? So if you're going to do a McMurray's test, what does that indicate? That's going to be a meniscal tear. So McMurray's meniscal tear. And remember the McMurray's, they're going to be lying on their back. You flex up their knee, one hand on the knee, one hand on the foot. And you're basically grinding the menisci um, to see if there's any pain with internal external rotation of the of the tibia. So that's the McMurray's test, and you're going to be looking for a meniscal tear with that. What is the first line treatment for carpal tunnel? So what is the first line treatment for carpal tunnel? That's going to be night splint. So you want them to wear a splint throughout the night. So first line treatment for carpal tunnel, always be conservative first line. It's going to be night splint. What is the most common cause of a C-spine fracture? What is the most common cause of a C-spine fracture? That's going to be MVAs, motor vehicle accidents. That whiplash injury, they can have a, easily get a C-spine fracture. So a patient in MVA, you always want to know about the C-spine fracture. What is the medical term for hunchback? So that's kyphosis. So hunchback, kyphosis, they're bending over. And what is the... Um, term for, I think they call it sway back. That's going to be lordosis. So it looks like an L in their lower back is the opposite of kyphosis. So kyphosis, they're hunched over. Lordosis is the opposite. It's like an L in the lower back. So I remember it. And it's bent out there. Extension of the lumbar, lumbar vertebrae. What is another term for a podagra? So we really hit gout today pretty good. What is another term for podagra? That's going to be gout. <clears throat> A patient presents to the ER with saddle anesthesia and also a loss of bowel and bladder function. So they're in the ER, saddle anesthesia, and a loss of bowel and bladder function. What is the most likely diagnosis? So that's important. That's cauda equina. So you can't miss cauda equina. You always want to think about if they have saddle anesthesia, loss of bowel or bladder function as well. What's the most likely diagnosis? And that's going to need, what is the treatment for cauda equina? Emergent um, neurosurgery for uh, nerve decompression, spinal decompression. A patient with HIV presents with severe groin pain. What is the most likely diagnosis? So HIV, they're immunocompromised. A patient with HIV presents with severe groin pain. What is the most likely diagnosis? That's going to be avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Antiretroviral medication put a patient at risk for this AVN. So a side effect of the antiretroviral medications is an increased risk of avascular necrosis. So next one is a 95-year-old female presents to the ER after a fall in her home. Her leg is shortened and externally rotated. What's the most likely diagnosis? So her leg is shortened 
She's elderly, came to the ER, she fell, her leg is shortened and importantly, externally rotated. What's the most likely diagnosis? So that's gonna be a hip fracture. So the hip fracture could be a femoral neck fracture, it could be an intertrochanteric fracture, but hip fracture that's externally rotated and shortened. So if you think about it, if we cut one of those parts, the um, trochanter or the femoral neck, it's gonna be, gravity's obviously gonna push it back. So her leg's gonna be shortened and externally rotated. So internally rotated and adducted, what would you think of? So same presentation, she fell, but her hip is internally rotated and adducted, adducted. Then you would think of posterior hip dislocation. So the hip dislocates out and basically adducts the hip. So adduction and internal rotation, you wanna think of posterior hip dislocation, but if it's shortened and externally rotated, you wanna think of hip fracture. Okay, so you recommend bisphosphonates for a patient with osteoporosis. What instruction do you give her for immediately after taking the medication? So very important, remain upright for 30 minutes. And what side effect are you trying to avoid with this? So why do we re recommend that they drink um, a full glass of water and stay upright for 30 minutes after taking bisphosphonates? So there's a black box warning for osteonecrosis of the jaw for bisphosphonates. So always bisphosphonates, instruct them to drink with a full glass of water, 30 minutes remaining upright after. What is the most common cause of a hip dislocation? What is the most common cause of a hip dislocation? Is it usually anterior or posterior? So we kind of alluded to this one already. So MVA, a high impact trauma is the most common cause, but an MVA would be the most common cause for a hip dislocation, and it's mostly posterior. So if you think about it, like a dashboard injury really shifts the, uh, the hip backwards. So it's a lot harder for it to come forward than it would be to backwards. So posterior is the most common hip dislocation. Which of the four rotator cuff muscles is most commonly injured? So which of the four rotator cuff muscles is most commonly injured? So that's gonna be the supraspinatus. And we already said one of the tests for the supraspinatus would be the NEARS test, the NEARS impingement test, and EER, NEARS impingement test, and also the Hawkins test, also the Hawkins test. So the supraspinatus is most commonly injured. What is the medical term for tennis elbow? That's gonna be lateral epicondylitis for tennis elbow. And of course, the opposite is golfer's elbow, and that's medial epicondylitis. What is the first line treatment for RA, rheumatoid arthritis? What is the first line treatment for RA? That's gonna be methotrexate. A patient presents to the ER after taking a baseball bat to the knee. He is unable to actively extend the knee. What is the most likely diagnosis? Patella fracture. So patella fracture, most likely diagnosis, he was hit in the knee. So of course, if you can't extend it, there's something that's not connecting the quad to the tibia, and that's the patella. So if you have a broken patella, then of course you can't extend the knee. What are most shoulder dislocations, anterior or posterior? So what are most shoulder dislocations, anterior or posterior? And that's gonna be anterior. Anterior is by far the most common um, shoulder dislocation. I think it's like over 90% are anterior dislocations. Posterior dislocations of the shoulder would be in something like electrocution or in seizures. So unless they presented with that, like they were just electrocuted or they had a seizure, then you would think um, anterior dislocation. <clears throat> and also for anterior and posterior shoulder dislocation, what are the two signs you can see on radiograph of the humeral head or of the glenoid? So you could see a hill sacs lesion or a Bankart lesion. So those are both also in shoulder dislocations. What is the most useful physical exam test for diagnosing an ACL tear? So what is the most useful exam test for diagnosing an ACL tear? That's gonna be the Lachman's followed by the anterior draw. So the Lachman's is the most sensitive and specific. So remember 15 degrees of flexion of the knee, pulling forward, seeing if there's a soft endpoint or a hard endpoint, hard endpoint, would be the ACLs intact. Soft endpoint would be, it's not really intact. So, so, and then anterior draw test is second, second to that. What is the most common knee injury? So what is the most common knee injury overall is medial, medial meniscal tear. 
<clears throat> where are the Heberden's nodes found? Where are the Heberden's nodes found? These are found in the DIP, the distal interphalangeal joint. And we said Heberden's is distal. And what are the ones found in the PIP? What are the nodes found in the PIP? That's going to be the Bouchard's nodes. And this is all in osteoarthritis. So a patient presents with knee pain following a soccer game two days ago. He has joint line tenderness medially and, flees and feels a locking of the knee from time to time. So remember, locking of the knee. What two physical exam tests do you want to do? So knee pain following a soccer game two days ago, joint line tenderness medially, and a locking of the knee. So two indicators right there, joint line tenderness and locking of the knee. This probably is a medial meniscal tear, like we said, the most common knee injury overall. So you definitely want to do the McMurray, like we said, or the Apley grind test would be appropriate. So the Apley grind test is the same thing as McMurray, except the patient's prone and you're basically grinding. You're putting one hand on the foot and grinding the tibia into the uh, femur, basically, and seeing if there's pain. So it's going to test for the menisci as well. A patient presents with conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. So remember, C, U, A, conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis, and oral lesions. What would you expect is the most likely diagnosis? And what lab test might you want or might you expect to be positive? So what lab test is positive if they have conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis? And what's the most likely diagnosis? So that's going to be reactive arthritis. So reactive arthritis, part of our pair mnemonic, P-A-I-R, and that's going to be HLA B27. So the P-A-I-R, psoriatic, ankylosing spondylitis, um, intestinal arthritis, so like IBD arthritis, and reactive arthritis. And so those are all your seronegative spondyloarthropathies. So they're seronegative because the ANA will be negative if you get one. But if you do further testing, an HLA B27 will be positive. So remember PAIR for your seronegative spondyloarthropathies with a negative ANA, but a positive HLA B27. Okay, so a 46 year old male comes into the ER limping a little on the right side. He states that it felt as though he was kicked in the back of the knee during a soccer game, back of the leg during a soccer game, but clearly no one was behind him. What's the most likely diagnosis? So no one was behind him. He's limping. He was kicked in the back of the leg in a soccer game. So that's most likely Achilles tendon rupture. Achilles tendon rupture. And of course, what's our treatment potentially for Achilles tendon rupture? We want to put them in resting Aquinas with their foot slightly plantar flexed. Okay, so anti jo one antibodies would make you think of what diagnosis? anti jo one antibodies. That's polymyositis. A positive crossover test indicates what diagnosis? So a positive crossover test indicates what diagnosis? That's going to be AC joint injury, so chromiocubicular joint. How about a positive Hawkins test? What does that indicate? Positive Hawkins test indicates rotator cuff impingement, especially supraspinatus. A positive Finkelstein's test indicates what? We already said this before. That's going to be Dacre veins tenosynovitis. And it's also more common in pregnant women. So don't forget pregnant women and Dacre veins tenosynovitis. So a positive Phelan and Tenniel sign indicates what diagnosis? So a Phelan and Tenniel sign indicates what diagnosis? Carpal tunnel. Phelan and Tenniel sign. Tenniel's tapping over the median nerve. And Phelan is putting your hands like this, basically. For one minute, elicits pain down the median nerve distribution. So a bamboo spine indicates what diagnosis? For bamboo spine, you want to think of ankylosing spondylitis. And what is ankylosing spondylitis? We just said it's an HLA B27 positivity. And it's a seronegative spondyloarthropathies, part of the pair mnemonic. So ankylosing spondylitis, part of the pair mnemonic, and also a bamboo spine. A positive SLR, straight leg raise, indicates what diagnosis? So positive straight leg raise, you want to think of a herniated disc. So a herniated disc could be pressing on that sciatic nerve, 
leading to pain with the straight leg raise. An African-American female presents with a Maillard rash, a Maillard rash and a positive DS, double-stranded DNA antibody. What's the most likely diagnosis? So lupus. So lupus more common in African-American females and also Maillard rash and also DS DNA, double-stranded DNA antibody is most common. Carpal tunnel affects what nerve and what parts of the hand? So carpal tunnel, it affects the median nerve. And what, what, what is the median nerve distribution on the hand? So of course it affects the thumb. And remember, we're looking at the um, volar side as well. So the thumb, the pointer and the ring fingers. So the thumb and the first two and a half fingers from there on. Wasting is a side of advanced disease. So wasting of the thenar eminence, you want to think it's a, uh, advanced disease for a long time. There's been no innervation to that muscle, so it's just going to start to atrophy. So a patient with a silver fork deformity on x-ray, what is the most likely diagnosis? So a dinner fork or a silver fork deformity, you want to think of Collie's fracture. And we saw this one already. A positive aptly grind test indicates what? That's meniscal tear. Remember, they're prone. You're grinding their menisci together. That's an aptly grind test, and that's meniscal tear. What are the six medications that can be used for migraine prophylaxis? So what are the six medications you can use for migraine prophylaxis? Six meds for migraine prophylaxis, that's beta blockers, tricyclics, calcium channel blockers, NSAIDs, and valproic acid. So beta blockers, tricyclics, calcium channel blockers, NSAIDs, and valproate. So a patient um, presents with what appears to be an inability to understand speech. What type of aphasia should be at the top of your differential? So that's Wernicke's aphasia. So it's important to differentiate Wernicke's from Broca's aphasia. So Wernicke's is going to be a comprehensive aphasia, and Broca's is going to be broken speech. So it's going to be an expressive aphasia. So that's how I remember it. Broca's aphasia, they have broken speech. So it's an expressive aphasia. <clears throat> And Wernicke's is compre uh, comprehensive because they can't understand it. So how I also remember that is Wernicke's is a longer word than Broca, and comprehensive is a longer word um, than expressive. So Wernicke's comprehensive aphasia. So a patient presents with facial paresis, also an arm drift and abnormal speech. What are your first three tests to order? So facial facial, paresis, arm drift, and abnormal speech, what do you want to order? So you'd be thinking of a stroke immediately, so you want to order a non-con, non-contrast brain CT, or an MRI if you have time, and also serum glucose and oxygen saturation. So we want to see if they're just hypoglycemic, if that's the cause of this, and if they're getting enough oxygen as well. So non-contrast brain CT is definitely first. A patient is brought in following a seizure in which she did not lose consciousness. What's the most likely diagnosis? So no loss of consciousness is simple partial seizure. Um, complex partial seizure is going to be loss of consciousness. So it's going to be one part of the brain with no loss of consciousness. That's simple partial. If they do lose consciousness, complex partial, that's one part of the brain with a loss of consciousness. A patient is having a stroke and there is no evidence of hemorrhage. What is the first line medical management? So they're having a stroke, no evidence of hem hemorrhage, what do you want to do? Within the first 48 hours and with no contraindications, thrombolysis should be given. So thrombolytics, um, if you rule out hemorrhage with a non-contrast CT first. A patient presents with a painful ipsilateral third nerve palsy. What's the most likely diagnosis? Third nerve palsy. So what is that? Third nerve palsy is the oculomotor nerve. Remember, first is the olfactory, then the optic, then the oculomotor nerve. And that's going to be a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. So the posterior communicating artery, and you want to think of that occipital cortex because that's where vision is from. So how you can remember that is the oculomotor nerve is a third nerve, third cranial nerve, and that has to do with vision. So the posterior communicating artery aneurysm, if it ruptures, that's also going to have to do with vision. So you can remember that. <clears throat>
what seizure medication may cause overgrowth of the gums? So that's called gingival hyperplasia. What seizure med is this? It's going to be phenytoin. So phenytoin has a lot of side effects. What is a thunderclap headache make you think of? So a sudden thunderclap headache should make you think of what diagnosis? So a sudden thunderclap headache should make you think of what diagnosis? That's subarachnoid hemorrhage, SAH, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And what medication do you want to give after you realize they have a subarachnoid hemorrhage to prevent vasospasm in the brain? You can give nemotipine at that point, a calcium channel blocker. So again, sudden thunderclap, you want to think of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you can give nemotipine for that. That's not the all-in-all -all treatment, of course, but uh, that's something you can give to decrease vasospasm. Because if there's blood, it's usually from a ruptured aneurysm, so if the blood comes out, that's going to be irritating the nearby vessels, which can cause the vasospasm. So if you can give them the, if you can give them the nemotipine, then that helps decrease that spasm. So describe a Kernig's sign. So Kernig's sign, this is when the patient lies supine on their back, flexes the hip while keeping the knee straight. Back pain is positive. So they're lying on their back, you flex their hip up, and you keep their knees straight. So if they have back pain during this, you're basically stretching the spinal column a little bit, and therefore the C uh, CSF is, and stuff is irritated in there, so it's going to cause pain if it's positive. So imaging, imaging is negative for blood, but you strongly believe that there is a SAH, subarachnoid hemorrhage. What test can you do that will be definitive? So you got a negative non-contrast CT, but you still think there's a subarachnoid hemorrhage, what will you do next? So you'll do a lumbar puncture. What would you see on lumbar puncture if, if it was positive? So you got a negative test originally, but now it's positive. What finding are you going to see on LP? You're going to see xanthochromia, xanthochromia on CT. I mean on LP, which is a tinged red blood cells coming from the CSF. A patient presents with lateralized throbbing headache. So lateralized throbbing headache. He's also complaining of nausea, vomiting, and photophobia. What's the most likely headache that he's having? Having. So that's going to be migraine. So that sounds like classic migraine symptoms, especially lateralized throbbing. Also nausea, vomiting, and photophobia. So those are all classic migraine symptoms. A middle-aged male presents with unilateral periorbital headaches occurring daily for several weeks. These headaches are extremely painful. What type of headache is the most likely cause? So middle-aged male, important key there. Migraines are more common in females. So middle-aged male, this is unilateral. It's periorbital. Um, and it's occurring daily for several weeks. So it's on and off and it's extremely, extremely painful. This is a cluster headache cluster headache, and you want to give them 100% oxygen as well as the first line for this. List three drugs that can treat cluster headaches. So this is what we just said. List three drugs that can treat cluster headaches. So you have to know that oxygen you want to give them first. You want to give them a lot of liters, I believe like 6 to 12 liters, nasal cannula if you can, oxygen, sumatriptan, and uh, yeah, so oxygen, sumatriptan, also red calcium channel blockers can be given in the long term, such as verapamil, the non-dihydropyridine for cluster headaches. So a 34-year-old presents with symptoms which are relapsing and remitting, so important, relapsing and remitting, 34-year-old, over the past few weeks. These include visual problems, importantly, and also weakness in her, her right arm, what is the most likely diagnosis. So that's going to be multiple sclerosis, multiple, um, multiple cues there for multiple sclerosis. That's going to be her, so it's more common in females. Young to middle age, so 34. Relapsing and remitting, that's the most common type of multiple sclerosis. And visual problems, so visual pro problems, optic neuritis, that's the most common initial manifestation of multiple sclerosis. So a patient has a tremor with motion of his hands. What medication would you prescribe? So tremor with motion of his hands, you want to prescribe um, a beta blocker. So propanolol is a good start. So this is an active tremor. You can start with propanolol for that. And also they might say in the question stem that it gets better when the patient drinks alcohol. So 
a uh, a trimmer like that will get better with alcohol and also propanolol, importantly. So a shuffling gait would make you think of what diagnosis? So shuffling gait makes you think of Parkinson's disease. Give two classes of drug therapy for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So two classes of drug therapy for Parkinson's, you can do dopaminergic like levodopa, carbidopa, and also anticholinergics, which are second line. And anticholinergics solo are better for treating um, some of the symptoms of the, of the Parkinson's. Where dopaminergic, that's gonna be the most helpful because we have a lack of dopamine in Parkinson's. So decreased GABA, GABA aminobutyric acid, and substance P should make you think of what diagnosis? So that's Huntington's. So decreased GABA and decreased substance P should make you think of Huntington's. And is Huntington's autosomal dominant or recessive? So they often ask, is Huntington's autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive? And it's important to know it's autosomal dominant. So autosomal dominant for Huntington's. So a patient presents with weakness that he has felt in his lower legs and now feels in his knees and hips bilaterally. He has decreased DTRs, and this has been getting progressively worse. What is the most likely diagnosis? So that's Guillain-Barre. So how I remember that is four A's, irreflexic, ascending, antecedent event as well. Um, so I guess three A's, antecedent event, such as um, a respiratory infection, um, or a GI infection like Campylobacter jejuni, ascending, so it starts in the legs and increases upwards as well, and areflexic, so they have decreased DTRs. So three A's for Guillain-Barre. What percentage of strokes are ischemic? What percentage of strokes are hemorrhagic? So what percentage of strokes are ischemic? 80%, and hemorrhagic is only 20%. So hemorrhagic would be like a subarachnoid hemorrhage and ischemic would be like a acute um, embolic stroke or just a general ischemic stroke, thrombotic stroke. If you believe a patient has had a stroke, he presents with aphasia, loss of hearing in one ear and loss of vision in his left eye. Is the blockage likely anterior or posterior circulation? So that's gonna be anterior circulation. Under what conditions would aspirin or clopidogrel be used as TIA prophylaxis? So when would you use aspirin, aspirin or clopidogrel as TIA prophylaxis? So these are antiplatelets, and they should be used unless there is a known cardiac etiology for the embolism. A known cardiac etiology for the embolism, then you use the antiplatelet medications. And patients with a cardiac cause should be put on heparin or coumadin, so warfarin. A patient who is asymptomatic should consider having an endarterectomy at what percentage blockage of the carotid artery? Or how about an asymptomatic patient? So endarterectomy, you go in and remove the plaque from the carotid artery. That would be a carotid endarterectomy. What percentage do you do this? So you do it at the carotid arteries um, blocked by 70% if they're asymptomatic, but if it's greater than 60% in a symptomatic patient. So 70% asymptomatic, over 60% in a symptomatic patient. So a patient presents complaining of the worst headache of their life, what might you expect their blood pressure to be? So what do you expect their blood pressure to be if they're having the worst headache of their life, which we already said is subarachnoid hemorrhage? So you'd expect the blood pressure to be elevated. So remember the number one cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is a berry aneurysm rupture. So typically they have high blood pressure and then it pops that aneurysm open. Name one abortive drug for migraines. So what are some of the abortive drugs for migraines? So to take away the migraine when you're already starting to have it. So triptans like sumatriptan, zolmatriptan, rizotriptan, and also ergotamines. So it's important to know triptans first line, best abortive med, but they're also vasoconstrictors. So they work like a little bit like caffeine, except much more, much more potent and contraindicated in pregnancy, cardiovascular disease, other vasospastic disorders. And also know triptans are a little bit more um, focused in the area that they affect, like in the brain, but ergotamines, they kind of vasoconstrict the whole body. 
<clears throat> in a way. So the side effects of ergotamines are like gangrenous bowel and um, gangrene of the fingers and things like that. So they have some side effects, but triptans are your first go-to med for abortion, for, for abortive meds in migraines. All right, I think we'll stop there and we'll continue on in the next video.